message will not go as you expect. But God has something for you today. Let me just remind you that the handouts we've been giving out <clears throat> for the uh, Revelation series have been replenished. Um, just want to laud the many folk who watch in. We have many people online who are getting the handouts and calling for them, downloading them, and I want to thank the AV team for what they have done to make that possible. But I've replenished <clears throat> the handouts, 1 through 11, and they're out there today if you happen to have missed one of those handouts. Our theme for the year, of course, has been ready. The theme for this quarter is ready to stand. The sermon image to the beast. Brother Rhodes read uh, very adequately uh, the verses in Daniel 3, 1 through 3. Let us now read the companion verses in Revelation. In Revelation. Go to Revelation, the 13th chapter, and then we'll have just a brief word of prayer. Revelation, the 13th chapter. And you may not have thought of these verses as companion verses to the incident in Daniel 3, but they are. So in Revelation 13 and verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Verse 14, continuing to comment on this second beast, in Revelation 13. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. To make a what? To make a what, everybody? An image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship. Notice the issue is what? Worship. Would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. We're talking here, Dr. Cologne, about religious liberty. Revelation 13, listen to me, folks. Revelation 13 declares that in our day some power is going to force you to worship. You see, religious liberty is simply defined, Rick, as the right to worship as you please and as the right not to worship if you please. And we are blessed to live in one of the rarest countries on the planet where not only are you allowed right now to worship as you please, but not to worship if you please. And having had the privilege of circling this globe and preaching in many, many countries, over 50 countries, I can tell you that even in countries that so-called allow you to worship, there are state-sponsored churches where the government favors one religion by paying its clergy and taking care of the edifices. Even a country like England has a state-sponsored church. We consider them to be a very democratic country, but they have a state-sponsored church. But in this country, we have separated church and state. But the text says that the day will come, and this prophecy concerns the world, not just here and there, the world. The day will come when there will be a power who will force you to worship this image, whether you want to worship or not. Now, you're sitting here calmly, but you ought to be very concerned. Because if I read Revelation, Pastor Daniels, correctly, the time for this incident is not far hence. It's not a long way off. 
Let's pray. Lord, guide us now as we unfold this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let me take you to a statement. Can you see it? Everybody can read it? Come on, let's read it together. There is a need of a much closer study of the Word of God. Would the saints say amen? amen. Now, the, 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 the writer becomes specific. Especially, come on everybody, especially should what? Pause, pause. What books? Now, we understand. See, I, 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 I'm glad earlier to be in the Seventh-day Adventist church. God has given us understanding. We understand the Seventh-day Adventists that Daniel and Revelation are one book in two separate places in the Bible. One book. Daniel was told at the end of his book, close it till the end. Revelation was told, keep it open. So Revelation is Daniel open, Daniel is Revelation closed. So you have to study both books, both books. And you're going to see today that the doctrine of the image to the beast is in both books. And it takes both books to fully understand this teaching. So let's go back and read it again. Come on, start at the beginning. There is a need of a much closer study of the Word of God. Read on. Should Daniel and the Revelation have attention as never before. So I'm in good company. I've been instructed to do this. God has said, Pastor, tell your, tell, your, tell your congregation and expose them to the joined study of what two books? So here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. And so on this Religious Liberty Weekend, I want to get into this. Now, stay in Revelation 13 before we go to Daniel. Revelation 13 begins in verse 1 with the announcement of this beast. This beast that is uh, a composite beast. Notice in verse 2, the beast has the, the feet like a leopard and has the, uh, it has the, uh, uh, was like a leopard and his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And we, we know from a previous study, a, a sermon that I preached, that this beast in Revelation 13 is a composite of four beasts found where? Daniel 7. Come on, class, don't let me down now. Daniel 7. Daniel 7 has the lion, has the bear, has the leopard, and the nondescript beast. We know that these two beasts, these beasts in Daniel 7, become the one beast in Revelation 13, but Revelation 13 introduces something very interesting to us in verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Where did he get his power? I need people talking to me. Where did he get his power? And who was this dragon? Re the dragon is identified in Revelation 12 and verse 9. So this, watch it now, those four beasts in Daniel 7 were four kingdoms. So we're talking political power. Now one beast has all the political power of those four. But it's also religious power because it gets its power from who? The dragon. So now we have secular and religious power joined, Sonia. Joined. Study the history of this world, folks. The worst persecutions that have ever taken place on this planet have always happened when the church and the state get together. Study history. Just, just study, take any world history book. The Christian church got in trouble when the Roman emperors joined the Christian church. When secular power and religious power come together, we got problems. We got problems. So in Revelation 13, this is introduced, and then this beast in Revelation 13 does some very interesting things. Uh, look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. What does this beast in Revelation 13 do? He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. We know that's 1260 years. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. This is exactly what's described of the nondescript beast in Daniel 7. Verse 7. It was granted him to make war with who? War with who? 
Who's that? Well, you know who you are. You are the saints. That's right. You're a saint. Yeah, don't be afraid of it. And the devil is going to make war with you, but he's going to use this beast to do it. And remember, we found out that the purpose of this beast is to force worship. To force worship. Then arises the second beast in Revelation 13. He takes this even further than the first beast and, of course, makes you worship or you will be killed. Verse 15. That's the beast in Revelation 13, Gene. Let's go to Daniel 3. Let's go to Daniel 3. Let me show you something. There's a fellow in Daniel named Nebuchadnezzar. Let's just call him Neb for short. Old Neb. Neb was a big time ruler. And according to Daniel 2, God sends his servants, whom Nebuchadnezzar has captured. These are people of God. I want you to listen to me, folk. Daniel and his friends are captured. See, in the last days, God is going to put his people in some tough places. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. Very up, upset, can't figure it out. You know the rest of the story. Word gets out, kill all the, uh, the, uh, the associates and the advisors because no one can tell him the dream. Word gets to Daniel. Daniel and his friends go in and say, hey, we know a God who can do this. They pray, God reveals it. And they open before Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Daniel 2. You're turning to Daniel 2. And he goes to the image. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching. Behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you. Its form was awesome. The image's head was of gold, chest of silver, Thighs of bronze, legs of iron, verse 33. Stone comes down, strikes it, mountain rises up, so forth and so on. Verse 36, the interpretation. Stay with me, stay with me. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Now watch verse 37. Watch verse 37. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom of power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children, verse 38, of men, dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are the, you are the, who's the head of gold? Old Neb. Old Neb is the head of gold. The image has four metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and then iron and clay, right? Now... Daniel says, you are the head of gold. It's important you remember that because you can't understand chapter 3 unless you remember that point. Well, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 is so impressed with what Daniel does. At the end of the chapter, he has what almost seems like a conversion. Verse 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded they should present an offering and an incense to him. The king answered, Daniel, and said, Truly your God is the God of gods. Nebuchadnezzar is moved, the Lord of kings, a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. He promotes Daniel, so forth and so on. And Nebuchadnezzar is really feeling good. But early he gets to thinking about that image. Because Daniel tells him that the gold is going to be replaced by what? Silver, another kingdom. And that the silver kingdom is going to be replaced by another kingdom, bronze, another kingdom. And that the bronze kingdom is going to be replaced by another kingdom, iron, another kingdom. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to last. Even though Nebuchadnezzar had kind of a con 
kind of a kind of conversion, he gets to thinking about it. And he gets to thinking about it. And Brother Rhodes, he thinks about it more and more. And he says, you know what? I have an idea. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Are you listening to me? Yeah, you're with me now. I see you smiling now. You know where pastor's going now. You didn't figure me out now. Here it is. Here it is. Nebuchadnezzar, the king made a image of... Wait a minute, Neb. That's not how the dream went. The dream was what? Gold, then, then, then iron. Look, look at you, look at you. These sharp Bible students. Neb said, I don't like the way God's word went. I don't like the way the Bible is written. I don't like what it says. I'm going to change it. See, folk, my subject is the image to the beast. You're going to find out in a few minutes who the beast really is. And Nebuchadnezzar, with his bold self, like some people on planet Earth today, decides to rewrite the Bible to suit his own beliefs and his own desires. Bible says seven days is the Sabbath, Sunday will do. Bible says drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. We'll drink wine when there ain't no sake. Well, y'all got quiet. Nobody said amen on that. Let me say amen. Amen. <laughs> Bible says don't marry someone who doesn't have the same beliefs. We say, well, you know, he may not be a Seventh-day Adventist, but he's a Christian. I told you I wasn't going to enjoy this sermon. What I'm saying to you is, Nebuchadnezzar decides on his own to make the Scriptures fit his desires. And the image comes out all gold. But that ain't enough. Having made the image of gold, Brother Rhodes read it. Let's read on. And King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 2, sent word, sends out word to gather together the sat traps. I don't know who those fellows are. The administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Well, there was more going on here than dedication. Because verse 5 says, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony with all kinds of music, you shall bow down and worship. Do what? Oh, here's the image to the beast, Sonia, in Daniel. You see why Ellen White says we must study them both together. There's an image to the beast in Revelation, but now we get a better picture. That, beh listen to me, behind forced worship is the desire to make people believe what you believe. See, what's happening in Revelation, folk, is more serious than just a system of worship that somebody's going to make you follow. Behind the system is the thoughts of men. Behind the system is the beliefs of men. Behind the system is the thoughts of men. The real problem with the image of the beast is that somebody is going to force you to worship according to the way they think and not according to the way the Bible is written. And it started thousands of years ago in Daniel. When one man said, here's my image, which represents me, I'm gold, let's make the image gold. Forget the iron, forget the silver, forget the bronze, want nothing to do with that. I am the image. Worship me. And he's serious. Look at verse 6. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately. Not after prayer. Not after a trial. 
We're going to put you in the fire right now. I'm going to leave that alone. Phipps is going to deal with that. But this thing is serious. I can recall running a crusade in a little southern town toward Gibson, Mississippi. The Lord blessed us to baptize many souls. And there was a young lady who decided to be baptized. And her mother said to her, if you walk down to that tent and get baptized on that Saturday, you better have a place to stay. You will not be coming home. Now those are the old days when we did evangelism like E.E. E. Cleveland. And so you went to people's houses and you had them, remember Doc, do their baptismal bundle. And they brought their baptismal bundle that week before the baptism as an act of faith. She brought her bundle. She brought her bundle. Snuck out of the house with it. Brought her bundle. And on the day of the baptism, we looked, didn't see her. We looked, didn't see her. Started baptizing. Lord bless us, that day we baptized over 70 people. The church only had 21 members. And we were getting to the end of the baptism. I said, well, she's not going to come. And then we saw her coming down the street to be baptized. That young lady died just two years ago. She was a secretary in the Allegheny West Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Lived in the church for the rest of her life. But her mother sought to force her to worship according to the dictates of her mother's mind. Now let me say something serious to the folk who are sitting here this morning. We tend as Adventists, to present this doctrine and to teach it as if when somebody else makes us worship their way, that's bad. It's just as bad when you try to force somebody to worship our way. See, religious liberty is not one-sided. You may believe the seven days of the Sabbath, I do. You may believe certain things should not be eaten, I certainly believe that. You may believe the tithe and offering goes to the Lord. I believe that. But once you share that with somebody, you do not have the right to make them feel like they're going to hell because they don't do what you say. There's a reason why the Bible says, whosoever will, let him come. So forced by a Baptist, forced by a Catholic, forced by Seventh-day Adventists. All of it is wrong. Appeal? Yes. Preach the word? Yes. Have crusades? Yes. Open the door? Yes, David. Open the door. But once a person decides they don't want to do it, we must still love them as a Christian. Did I hear everybody say amen? amen. Try it one more time. But the subject is the image to the beast. God was very upset with Nebuchadnezzar after chapter 3. And so in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar confesses how God had to deal with him. He has this dream again, another dream. <laughs> and by now they've almost forgotten who Daniel was. Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, this time he sees a tree, and the tree is nourishing the whole world, but the tree gets cut down. Daniel comes and says, hey, you're the tree, you nourish everybody, but then he says, verse 24, here he goes again, this is the interpretation thereof. O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come down, my lord the king, they shall drive you from men your dwelling, dwelling shall be with the, your dwelling shall be with the. I wish somebody would pay attention to this sermon. Verse 28. All this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. Now God tells him. See, I don't know when Neb's going to begin to believe in God's visions. 
Verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he had, he had, he had 12 months to get himself together. A whole year to decide to accept God's word like it's written. After 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. We're talking about the beast, the image to the beast. Who really is the beast? The king spake, saying, verse 30, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty, while the word was still in the king's mouth? A voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men. Verse 33, that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. He became a beast. Let me finish my sermon. See, the image to the beast is actually a symbol of self-worship. The real beast is you! Not some image, not some false system, but the image is you! You're the one who takes God on. You're the one who says no when God says yes. You're the one who goes left when God says go right. You are the beast. And when you resist the Lord, someday it shall be revealed that the problem is you. Not the church, not the Catholics, not the government. It's you. You are the one who keeps saying, God says this, I want to do this. You're the beast. I told you the sermon wasn't going to go away, go the way you thought. You're the beast. You're the one who asserts himself against God. And that beast in Revelation 13 survives not because of a system. It'll be a system. Not because of a church. There'll be a church. Not because of a government. There'll be a government. But that system in Revelation 13 survives because too many little beasts in this country will decide that they know more than God. We had better to spend too much time talking about that beast in Revelation 13, pointing at that beast, that system, that false church. Yes, that's a part of the prophecy, but we've missed the most dangerous beast, the one that sits in the pew where you're sitting. The beast of self, the beast of opinion, the beast of resistance, the beast of pride. Are you worshiping that beast today? Did you worship that beast this week? Did God say no and did you go on and say yes? Because in that moment, you bowed your knee to self and spit in the face of Almighty God. And so, my dear ones and those watching in, Until we conquer this beast, we need not point the finger at Catholics or the government or anybody else. Because they can't make you do anything if this beast has been subdued by the Holy Ghost. Like Diane, my friend, I didn't call her name, who walked down that sidewalk that day and got baptized in spite of her mother. When you have subdued this beast, when you have submitted to God fully, when you say, if God says that I'm going to do it, if God says don't do it, I will not do it, when you come to that point, then I don't worry about you ever succumbing to the beast in Revelation 13 because God owns you. God owns me. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, 
I prayed over this sermon. And now you have delivered it. May we never see Revelation 13 the same. Fear the beast. Huh. But the beast is me. And so today, Lord, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I don't want you to have to do to me what you did to Nebuchadnezzar. You revealed to him how beastly he was, how self-centered, self-worshipping he was. Lord, kill the beast in me. Destroy the Henry in Henry. Then no man, no government, no religion will be able to force me to do anything against you because the beast will be dead. If you want that, folk, if you want the beast of yourself, to be destroyed by the grace of God. Would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand. Lord, you hear us. You see us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the people said, Amen. Amen.